thank you all for coming to our public meeting tonight. It's number two uh, for this phase of the 41st Street project. Uh, we've got a number of people from our study advisory team here tonight, representatives from Federal Highway Administration, um, from the Metropolitan Planning Organization. Uh, we have uh, four representatives of HDR. My name is James Unruh. I'm the project manager for the uh, HDR team. We have representatives from the City of Sioux Falls and also from uh, the South Dakota Department of Transportation. Uh, these folks make up our study advisory team and I will move back a little bit because this is a little bit echoing a bit here. Okay, what we're going to look at tonight, uh, we'll take a look at what's been done in the past to lead up to this point. Uh, we will summarize the key findings of our environmental studies for this 41st Street and I-229 project. Uh, this is really why we're all here, is to see the key benefits and the drawbacks of the various alternatives, and then to present to you the recommended alternatives. Uh, we are required by law to cover each alternative. That will unfortunately take some time. I believe we're in about the 45 minute time frame. So please be patient. We'll uh, make this move as quickly as possible. Then we will talk about the next steps for the project. And finally, at the end, I'll answer your questions and comments. Uh, perhaps it might be better to do those individually at the boards as well. We'll see at the end. I want to just touch on a little bit of a timeline here, uh, going back to a few years to what's been done up until 2012. And then we'll look at uh, our findings and our benefits and our drawbacks and recommendations that we've developed in 2016 and 2017. And then going forward from 2017, from now into the future, what are the next steps for this project? We took some uh, historical photos just as an overall context for this area. And if you look at this picture, uh, it's a, from 1958 from Marion Road to Louise Avenue along 41st Street. Obviously a very rural area uh, on the southwest side of Sioux Falls. Then, and just look, there's really no development along 41st Street. Then in 1961, I-29 was built as well as the 41st Street interchange. This picture was taken right after uh, the interstate was open. This area on the right of the slide is actually now all the Empire Mall. Uh, so this is right after it was open. Obviously things look much different now. Then, in 1969, we put this photo in there just to indicate that by 1969, we had development on the west side of I-29 and north of 41st Street, and the interstate is going through here. And you can see the basic position of the interstate relationship to Carolyn Avenue, Marion Road, and Louise. I put this picture in here from 1979 to show the Empire Mall. This was shortly after the Empire Mall was built, and you can see uh, now we have development on the south side of 41st Street. There's still some open areas here on the north side of 41st Street, but as all of this development took place, uh, 41st Street was expanded and widened to handle the traffic from all of this new development. By 1997, uh, really the whole area was developed. You've got everything filled in with development along 41st Street and really in the entire area. Now, uh, because of all of that development, all of that traffic, um, the cities took a step back and said, okay, let's plan for how we continue uh, to take care of 41st Street. So in 2000, the city did a corridor analysis. That actually went from Sertoma Avenue all the way to um, Cliff Avenue, really all the way across uh, Sioux Falls. And there they looked at um, crashes, uh, traffic, and they did make some recommendations for improvements. Uh, it was a very apparent to people driving it, and I certainly remember uh, going back to that time, crashes have been a problem on 41st Street as long as the traffic kept uh, growing. This is just a graphic from the 2000 study, and those dots show places where there were concentrations of accidents. So people have been aware and it's been studied that we've had crashes and crash problems on 41st Street uh, for a long time. 
Then in uh, 2010, uh, the Department of Transportation did a statewide interstate study and the 41st Street and I-29 interchange was part of that. Uh, they made recommendations based on traffic congestion and this is just a graphic from that 2010 report uh, that shows really a quite a bit of congestion at the ramp intersections and all of us that drive 41st Street are aware of the high levels of congestion the traffic backups on 41st Street especially at the interstate ramps. What they also found in 2010 was that uh, this interchange has one of the highest crash rates of all of, the of all of the interchanges in South Dakota. So all of these things are telling us the same thing. There's, there's traffic and crash problems along 41st Street in Sioux Falls. Um, that development, all of that is a good thing. It's a thriving commercial area and we just need to find ways to handle the traffic and improve uh, the safety. Then in 2012 we did a corridor study and maybe many of you took part in that as well uh, where we looked at 41st Street from Valley View Road to Kiwanis. Uh, again, we analyzed the crashes, we looked at traffic problems, and we developed, this is one of the graphics from our crash analysis that shows the number of crashes and the types of crashes in different segments of the uh, 41st Street corridor. We also developed very specific uh, improvement alternatives, and this is just a, a clip from one of the alternatives from that report. One other thing I want to point out about the historical aspect here. Uh, I-29 on the west side of Sioux Falls uh, was built in that 1961-1962 time frame. Then from 2002, uh, really until just last year, the interstate was upgraded to three through lanes all the way from I-90 down to I-229. And just last year, uh, the, really the stretch was completed with the 229 and 29 inter, um, interchange. All of these red dots along here represent interchanges that were either improved or new interchanges since 1996. So uh, in the last 20 years, uh, each of these interchanges had some work done on them. The only one that's missing in this entire corridor is the 41st Street interchange. So it is an appropriate time to be looking at improving 41st Street and this 41st Street interchange. That's the last one to be looked at along the I-29 corridor. Lots of money has been invested in this corridor and this is the last uh, really uh, cog in the wheel for I-29 on the, on the west side of Sioux Falls. Okay, in 2016, we began this study, which is an environmental and interchange study. And again, we analyzed crash and traffic problems. The biggest difference though, is that we are analyzing the impacts of those alternatives, those different alternatives that we've looked at, and we are recommending which ones to select for a future construction project. I'm gonna back up though uh, to 2015. What really initiated this current project and this study is that the State Transportation Improvement Plan uh, specifically identified 41st Street and the I-229 interchange as a project to be looked at in 2016. Uh, I put all of this stuff in the presentation just to show that this is not just some haphazard uh, random process. This is a well thought through process over the years to look at, okay, how do we improve 41st Street? How do we improve the interstate? How do we maintain it? How do we make sure that it serves the, uh, the public and serves the businesses along 41st Street for 20, 30, 40 years in the future? Uh, a very well thought through logical process and we are somewhat at the last stage of that. I'm just curious, how many of you were at our uh, public meeting about 10 months ago here at the Convention Center? Okay, a few of you were. That was really the kickoff for this uh, interchange and environmental study. All right, our project area now, what you see in the blue, that was the limits of our corridor study. Uh, we've narrowed that down now into this project, which will culminate in a construction project. And that, uh, what we're looking at now, is in the yellow. We actually have, and again, we are looking at from Marion Road to just east of Shirley Avenue. So a whole section, a little bit less than a mile of 41st Street, 
and also improving the interchange. So what you see in yellow is really what's under consideration now. Within that yellow area, there's really four separate, distinct, and independent areas where decisions need to be made. And, and that's where we're at in this process. We need to make those decisions. At the interchange, uh, you'll see we have a decision to make with, with which option to select at the interchange. Carolyn Avenue, uh, we have six alternatives at Carolyn Avenue. We have to select a, an alternative at Carolyn Avenue. 41st Street West of I-29, many of you represent that area. Uh, that's another distinct area. We have a decision to make there. And then 41st Street East of I-29 is another area of decision. And we will go through each of those areas and alternatives separately tonight. And what we, what we decide in one area does not necessarily dictate what we do in another area. These can be independent decisions. What are we trying to do out there? This is called our purpose and need. First of all, we're trying to improve traffic capacity. This is a graphic from our traffic study, and basically it boils down to these areas that have the red uh, hatching on them. Uh, currently and in the future, if we do nothing, we will have traffic that backs up, traffic that causes people to sit there and wait at the light for a minute, two minutes, and that's not acceptable. Um, I think everyone that drives a corridor knows that there are delays when you get to these intersections, and we do want to correct that. We also want to correct it for the future, not just for now. So we look at two, uh, two future years. We look at year 2023 and year 2045. Year 2023 is, in theory, right after construction will be complete. So we want to make sure it handles the traffic adequately when it's open. And we want to make sure that it tra uh, handles the traffic adequately at least 20 years past uh, when the roadway is open to traffic. So that's why we look at years 2023 and 2045 with this specific project. Let's look at safety. Uh, another item of our purpose and need is to improve traffic safety. These are two graphics from our crash analysis. We looked at accident data uh, in great detail. What you see in red, again, are pieces of 41st Street where the accidents are much higher than they should be. Uh, really, any accidents along 41st Street, the, the crash rates are higher than, than really any other place in the state, actually. Um, we did a thorough analysis of something very similar on 12th Street, just two miles north of 41st Street. I'm not going to go into great detail on the graphic, but uh, 12th Street, from 1994 to 1996, and I apologize that the text is somewhat blurry there, but from 1994 to 1996, we took traffic counts and uh, collected accident data. At that time, 12th Street was a five-lane roadway with a uh, two-way left turn lane. During that three-year period, uh, we had about 25, 26,000 vehicles on that section of road from, and this is actually from Kiwanis Avenue to Lyons Boulevard, really from about Kiwanis to I-29. And there were 200 crashes. Then in, in 1997 and 1998, that piece of 12th Street was rebuilt. It was widened to six lanes with a raised median. We went back and looked at another three-year period after it was improved traffic volumes had increased up to roughly 35,000 vehicles per day, but crashes had reduced down to 141 crashes. Really, what it boils down to is there was a 30% increase in traffic at the same time that there was a 30% decrease in crashes. And we have continued to track that over the years, and it has maintained that consistent high level of traffic with a relatively low uh, level of crashes. And this is consistent with what we find when we install a raised median on a, uh, either a four or six lane roadway. This graphic here just gives these numbers in a, in a little bit different manner. This blue bar, that was that segment of 12th Street before the raised median. Uh, we look at another statistic, it's called accidents per one million vehicle miles. And this data here translates into 9.8 accidents per 1 million vehicle miles. That's before the raised median was installed. Afterwards, uh, the, the crash rate dropped to 5.3 accidents per 1 million vehicle miles, so almost 
a halving of the, uh, the crash rate. Here is 41st Street. This is actually from Kiwanis, uh, from Kiwanis to Louise. Essentially this section right here, but it's consistent all along 41st Street. The crash rate uh, is about 9.7 accidents per million vehicle miles. So consistent with what we were finding on 12th Street. The yellow bar is a study that we did on uh, seven lane roadways in the southeastern United States uh, without a raised median. The crash rate there was 11 accidents per one million vehicle miles. So you can see we have a high crash rate. Our solution is to install a raised median wherever feasible. That is what uh, really decreases uh, those accidents because with the raised median, you can't make those left turns out. That's the most problematic movement, and we'll bring that in a couple of times more yet in this presentation. Um, that is our solution. The city and the Department of Transportation has, have actually established policies that anytime you have a six lane roadway, three lanes in each direction, you need to consider, you need to look at installing a raised median specifically because of the safety benefit. One other item on our purpose and need is to provide good pedestrian facilities. Uh, in this area, along Mary, around the Marion Road area, there's quite a few uh, places where there's assisted living, uh, um, handicapped living uh, sites. And quite frankly, you see this on 41st Street quite often where you have a wheelchair person that really has, can't get across streets. Uh, you really can't use the sidewalks. Here's a picture apologize for the lighting here, but 41st Street, the sidewalk, is really in bad shape. Uh, uh, um, wheelchair users and handicapped people have a very difficult time negotiating 41st Street. So that is another key purpose and need of the project, is to improve the pedestrian facilities. We really only had one environmental issue on this project, and that was the noise analysis, or the noise impacts. Obviously, when you've got a lot of traffic, uh, you have noise associated with it. So we did a noise study. What you see, all of these dots, are places where we either measured noise or used a computer model to predict noise levels. What we found, and this really only applied to residential locations where there's houses. That's really where you have to analyze what's happening with noise. The red dots, those were locations where our traffic levels uh, generate noise levels that exceed state and federal standards. And essentially those state and federal standards are based on if it's disturbing your speech so that people can't hear you talk, uh, that's above the standard. All of these houses actually uh, would experience noise levels above the state standard. Uh, these apartments over here, we do a blow up, blow up over here, they would also have noise levels that would exceed the state standard. So we looked at potentially a noise wall here and a noise wall along I-29. There are certain criteria that we have to abide by. Uh, the noise wall has to provide at least seven decibels of noise reduction. Uh, we actually went back and, and measured noise levels along the noise wall on I-29 between 49th and 57th. We actually did find that there was a seven decibel reduction from one side of the wall to the other side. So they do actually work. Uh, but it also has to be cost effective. The criteria that the Department of Transportation has established is that you, uh, it, the cost of the wall cannot exceed $21,000 per, basically per house per house where there's some benefit. So there has to be some cost feasibility to it. Uh, we looked at these two areas. This actually ended up being an eight foot high uh, noise barrier that worked the best. This I believe was about a 14 or 15 foot high noise barrier that worked the best. What we found out though was that the cost would be about $38,000 per benefited receptor or per, per benefited house, which actually it's exceeds uh, what's allowed by uh, the South Dakota Department of Transportation criteria. The apartments here, the cost would end up being about $30,000 per benefited receptor. So in both of these locations, yes, noise walls would be beneficial, but the cost is really too great. So we determined that it is not cost feasible to actually um, mitigate the noise levels um, in these locations along 41st Street and along I-29. So that was really our main environmental impact here. 
it didn't matter which roadway alternative we chose, the noise uh, study came out the same, the noise impacts came out the same. Let's now look at our alternatives, the benefits, the drawbacks, and the recommendations. For the interchange, we're going to do these in those four separate areas. The first one is the interchange. And here you have Empire Mall in the background. In this slide, uh, I-29 is, is left to right, north is to the right, 41st Street is up and down on the screen. We always have to look at the no-build condition. What if we just don't do anything? Would that solve the problem? Is that something that we should be doing? Well, we analyze it, and um, the no-build alternative does not, it does not accommodate the traffic. Uh, our traffic analysis showed that. Uh, the no-build alternative does not improve the safety. Uh, the no-build alternative would not improve pedestrian facilities. And one thing that you'll see a couple of times here, uh, here's Carolyn Avenue. And I'm sure many of you drive 41st Street, and if you drive Carolyn Avenue, the right turn lane for the I-29 northbound ramp uh, well, Carolyn Avenue is in that right turn lane. So if you get on Carolyn Avenue, you're almost forced onto the, um, the interstate or you have to go across a couple of lanes of traffic to keep going to the west. That is not allowed and would not be allowed in any improvements that we would propose. Let's look at a single point interchange. Um, these are, we have quite a few of these around town. There's one up at 12th Street and I-29 at Madison Street. Um, this one, uh, 41st Street would go above the interstate. The one that is the, the closest to this was is at uh, I-229 and 10th Street, where 10th Street actually goes above the interstate. In this case, that would be the case for 41st Street. It would go above I-29. Um, let's look at some of the benefits here. These are, you know, we have many of these around town. It does handle traffic adequately. This would handle the 41st Street traffic and I-29 traffic adequately. Uh, it's familiar to drivers and, and people like them. Uh, there are some drawbacks though. Uh, first of all, uh, to, to make these work, all of the traffic goes into a single point or a single um, single signal, and that's uh, how you get the single point interchange name. But to do that, you have to have these large ramps here, and then we have to have a very large bridge. Uh, a large bridge and large retaining walls means it's, it's quite a bit uh, more expensive. Actually, the cost of this interchange as it's drawn here would be about $21 million uh, to construct it the way we've shown it here. In addition, um, we'd actually have to raise 41st Street up by a couple of feet uh, to maintain clearance above I-29. Uh, to do that, it becomes difficult to maintain traffic during construction. And certainly we want to keep traffic flowing on 41st Street as smoothly as possible during any construction project. But if you raise 41st Street, it does become more difficult to maintain traffic uh, during construction. This is our diverging diamond interchange. We have an animation going on over on the, uh, the west side of the room here. Please take a look at that if you don't know how the diverging diamond interchanges operate. Uh, we spent quite a bit of time on that during the corridor study. So we're not going to go into the operation of the diverging diamond interchange. What I will say though is um, that it does handle traffic adequately just like the single point interchange. However, the cost is significantly lower, and that's mostly uh, because we don't necessarily have to rebuild the bridge, and we do not have to install all kinds of tall retaining walls along the interstate uh, to rebuild the ramps. A significant cost savings. Uh, we looked at it in the realm of, okay, we can get by with just widening, um, for widening the bridge. And that would cost, the whole interchange would cost about $11 million. So that's a significant difference from $21 million down to $11 million cost-wise. Even if we would rebuild the bridge, we could just keep a smaller footprint of the bridge um, and the cost would be about $15 million. So that cost difference has to be considered uh, if everything else is equal. Because we don't have to have a bigger bridge and because we don't have to raise 41st Street, it does make it easier to maintain traffic uh, during construction. Another big consideration for which alternative we select. There is one drawback to the diverging diamond interchange 
and that's that none have yet been built in South Dakota. I think nationwide there are about 60 of them. How many of you have been, have driven through a diverging diamond interchange? Okay, several have. One gentleman said that uh, one he was at was backed up for about three miles. So I, you know, we think that they work pretty well. We think this one would work well. Uh, but to be honest with you, none have been built in South Dakota yet. Um, this would probably be, if we do it here, it'd probably be the second or third one. There's one planned in Rapid City um, uh, at La Crosse Avenue and I-90. But uh, where they have been built, they have been well received. This, we're not gonna go into detail on this, but this is our comparison matrix where each of these four areas, we looked at different, different aspects of the alternatives. Uh, this alternative was a single point. This is the diverging diamond interchange. Uh, we looked at things like, okay, does it meet our purpose and need? Does it handle traffic adequately? Uh, does it improve safety? And several other features. Uh, we look at cost. And in this scenario, cost is really one of the driving factors to go from a $21 million project for the single point versus anywhere from 11 to 15 million is a large cost difference. That being said, our recommendation is that we move forward with this diverging diamond interchange because of the lower cost, uh, because it handles traffic better during construction. Also, what they're finding with these diverging diamond interchanges is that they are relatively safe. They operate more safely than a single point interchange. So we would have a benefit of a lower crash rate. Um, and we are not recommending moving forward with the single point interchange alternative. 41st Street west of I-29. That's the next step here is for, uh, I-29. Here's Marion Road. This piece goes really from Marion Road over to I-29. The, on the no-build scenario, now we flip the map here, so you have to be able to reorient yourself. I-29 is going north, uh, up and down on the map. Uh, 41st Street is going left to right, and north is up. If we do nothing on, on 41st Street, the no-build alternative does not accommodate the traffic. Uh, we have a lot of traffic growth on the west side of town here, and doing nothing does not handle the traffic. It does not improve the safety, and it does not improve the pedestrian facilities. Alternative A, we actually have four alternatives uh, for 41st Street. With alternative A, the features, we list them down in the corner here, but basically to make the traffic work, we need to widen 41st Street to three through lanes in each direction. Otherwise, the traffic simply will not, uh, will not flow on 41st Street. In this alternative, we are showing a raised median. So what you see in red is a raised median on 41st Street. Uh, in this case, the only openings in alternative A would be at Terry Avenue and at Marion Road. Uh, otherwise, that raised median would go right down the middle of 41st Street. If we look at a section view, right about at the Godfather's Pizza Mount Marty area, remember I showed you that picture from 1969 where all of these houses were built by 1969 and they were built right up against 41st Street. The development on the south side of 41st Street came later and those buildings and developments were set back from 41st Street. So the only way to feasibly widen 41st Street is to move it to the south. So here's the existing sidewalk along uh, the north side of 41st Street. We would not change that. We would not move 41st Street at all to the north. All of our widening, and we're adding a lane in each direction, and we're adding a raised median. So we are widening the whole roadway. All of the widening occurs on the, uh, on the south side of 41st Street because there's room there. It does not cause us to buy out uh, properties, really. All of the build alternatives, any improvement we make, will improve the pedestrian facilities. So that's a given in all of these alternatives that we're looking at uh, for improvements. Now, the main benefits here of this raised median alternative A, uh, it does handle traffic. Any of these alternatives with six lanes does handle the traffic very well. With the raised median, uh, we do have our safety benefits, which is a, really a purpose and need of the project. Uh, this is ba basically an ancillary part of it. Uh, the city and the DOT, like I said, have provided policies that if you do have six lanes in each direction, you will look at a raised median. So that uh, raised median option does meet that uh, policy. 
The one drawback here, um, this intersection right here, there's quite a few commercial businesses uh, right around this area, and the perception from the business owners was that this raised median would really inhibit access to their businesses because you can't make uh, left turns from 41st Street uh, in any direction. So if you want to come um, on 41st Street to the west, you cannot make a left turn there. Okay, let's go on to alternative B here. What we've done now, it's identical to alternative A, except we've added what's called a three-quarter movement configuration right here at Madeline Lane and Gateway Boulevard. What it does is if you are going west on 41st Street, there is an opening in the median and you can turn left. If you're going east on 41st Street, there's an opening in the median and you can turn left and go north. What it uh, prohibits are these movements here. You cannot make a left out, you cannot make a left out, and you cannot go through. Basically, you can make three of the four main movements at these intersections. We've had some questions, okay, what do these look like? So I threw in here a picture. This is actually from 66th Street in Edina, Minnesota. And what you can see here is these cars come in here and they can make a left turn, but you can't make a left turn across this median and come back across traffic. What I found on this one is that you feel perfectly safe sitting right there because you're protected on both sides from a raised median. There's a few of these around town, not too many, probably you haven't noticed them, but we did want to show a picture of it because people had some questions, what does this look like? And again, it prohibits that troublesome movement of going left out uh, and people not being able to make those left turns or they shoot the gap and we have crashes. Uh, the benefits of alternative B here. Uh, first of all, same as alternative A, it handles the traffic, it uh, gives us our safety benefit, it make, meets the policy for application of a raised median, and we believe that the three-quarter access here does address those access concerns. We took traffic counts on there to see, out there to see which way traffic is, is uh, flowing, and most traffic is, is making these left turns and then coming back uh, and making right turns. We did not find a lot of people making left turns. What they're doing, apparently, because it's tough to make those left turns, is they come over around to Terry and make a left turn at a signal. What you really find with these raised medians is you get people to a traffic signal to make a left turn or a U-turn. And we would allow U-turns at every one of these intersections at Marion Road, at Terry, and even at the, this three-quarter movement. You can make a U-turn um, and turn back to get to your wherever you want to go. There is one drawback here, and that is because of this, what we call the three-quarter configuration, it is a little bit wider. Uh, but still, it does not cause us to acquire properties because of that. This is identical, this is, we call this B2, the, the previous one was B1. In this case, we added one of those three-quarter movements here, and that was at the request of Mount Marty College. We do listen to people when they ask us questions, when they tell us to look at things on these projects. And in this case, uh, Mount Marty College said, well, what, you put a um, three-quarter access here, why don't you put one at Mount Marty College? So we did look at that. Uh, what we did find though, and here is a little blow up of it, in order to make that work, uh, it's quite a bit wider, so we would actually end up uh, eliminating Godfather's Pizza drive through uh, We would eliminate actually 18 parking spots, which is a big impact to all of these, to Godfather's, to the Black Diamond Casino, and to Mount Marty College. So let's go through our benefits. Again, same as the other ones. Uh, this three-quarter access here does address the concern of Mount Marty College. They're thinking that uh, the median restricts their access. I guess our response to that is the better way to get to Mount Marty College is at the signal and then on 43rd Street. Their main entrance to their parking lot is on from 43rd Street anyway. The main drawback. Again, it's these impacts to properties. We certainly consider that when we uh, select or recommend an alternative. And again, uh, the city has determined that if we put in one of these three-quarter access configurations, it should be at a public street or where there's multiple driveways that can be combined and can have a benefit from that three-quarter movement. And here it would only benefit uh, Mount Marty College and Godfather's Pizza. 
Okay, the final alternative here is alternative C, and again, I apologize, but we are legally bound to go through each of these and to give the basic rationale uh, for each of these alternatives. Alternative C, in this case, again, three lanes in each direction, but no raised median. This would be a mirror image of what's on 41st Street east of I-29. Same thing as what's there today. Uh, now, again, this does handle traffic, um, and we did certainly get general support from the businesses because full access, there's no restriction whatsoever on access along 41st Street. However, uh, the drawbacks are that it does not improve safety, a major drawback, and therefore it does not meet the policy uh, to implement a raised median when we have six through lanes. Here is our ma matrix, and I would encourage you, these are all on our website, and they are also on the boards uh, around the room here tonight, so please take a close look at them. The one thing that really dictates our decision here is the property impacts. So that's a very wide uh, section for this piece or this area of 41st Street, and it really dictated that we move forward uh, with alternative B1, or that we recommend it, uh, with the three-quarter access at Gateway and Madeline because safety benefits meets the design policies and we say that it provides reasonable access to properties and we've been working with the landowners and I think we've gotten them to buy off on it does provide reasonable access because you can still make those left turns off of 41st Street at Madeline and Gateway. We are recommending not moving forward with alternatives A, B2, and C. Uh, not going to go through that because we already went through the drawbacks of each of all those of each of those alternatives. Let's now go to 41st Street east of I-29. Thank you for being patient. Uh, we are almost through this. Uh, this is the Empire Mall, and here we're looking at I-29 to just east of Shirley Avenue is uh, the area of our east east alternatives. This is now a set seven lane section uh, on 41st Street. Uh, many of us drive that every day. I've driven it for years and years and years as many of you have as well. If we do nothing, uh, we really, traffic uh, is congested, but uh, the seven lane section does handle the traffic, but we don't have that safety improvement. And that's a big deal. We really need to improve uh, traffic uh, safety. We need to improve pedestrian facilities and it does not meet our design policy. Um, and the folks that left, I know that they were uh, folks from the west side of, of I-29. So if any of you see that your, your needs are addressed and you have to get home and get to supper, don't, he don't hesitate. I won't feel bad one bit here. Let's look at our proposed improvement alternatives. Um, alternative A, it's a raised median again. Uh, raised median, we show that three-quarter access configuration here at the Empire Mall entrance. The big improvement with alternative A, really with all of our alternatives, is the Shirley Avenue and 41st Street intersection. Right now it doesn't line up. Uh, you can't make all of the movements at 41st and Shirley. We would uh, make this four lanes, two lanes going into the mall and two lanes going out of the mall, and we would make Shirley Avenue uh, actually a five lane roadway section and put uh, dual left turn lanes on all approaches so this really becomes the main entrance and exit uh, to and from the Empire Mall. This is a section view. Now in this case um, we're doing some widening on the north side. This section is right here at the Panda Express. We're doing a little bit of widening on the, on the north side but most of the widening is on the south side. The reason we can do that is because Sioux Falls Ford is relocating, or has relocated. So this parcel right here is essentially vacant, and it's in the, in the planning stages for redevelopment. Had Sioux Falls Ford not moved, we would not be proposing any widening on 41st Street. But that does give us the opportunity to address the problems on 41st Street and make improvements. The benefits of this uh, alternative A here, again, it handles traffic. Those left dual left turn lanes and the signal will really improve traffic capacity along 41st Street. Again, the raised median provides our safety benefits. It does meet our design policy. And we are going to say that that three-quarter access does address the concerns of, bus of businesses for access. And as we've met with them, they have 
um, sometimes a little bit hesitantly, but have said, yes, that does address the majority of our concerns about access. Uh, the only drawback here is we have an alternative C uh, that does not have the raised median. So this, because we have the raised median, is slightly wider than the alternative C that you'll see coming up. Uh, but that was really the only drawback that we had with alternative A. Uh, let's talk about alternative B. This is identical to A except, except right here, and I highlighted it here. This is a one-way exit. You can only get out of the mall uh, going out to the north. It still works traffic-wise, uh, but as, as we looked at this with the Empire Mall, they really did not want to have a one-way um, system for the Empire Mall, essentially this road going out and this road going in. It didn't work well uh, with these businesses along uh, the access roads and just with the circulation in the mall, it didn't work very well. So our benefits the same as alternative A, uh, but the Empire Mall really, and we agree with it, did not want just a one-way access road. They preferred the two-way access entrance and exit roads. Alternative C is essentially what you have out there now, except we would still be improving the intersection of 41st and Shirley uh, with dual left turn lanes, and we'd also be uh, making a two-way entry and exit into the mall. This would again be the main entry and exit for the mall, and we'd be improving Shirley Avenue as well. Our benefits, again, handles traffic. Uh, we certainly have had good support from business owners on this because there's no perceived um, uh, access impact. Uh, I would argue with that because you saw in that video it was almost impossible to make left turns out anyway. So de facto you have a raised median functioning out there now because you really can't make left turns anyway. Uh, but from the business owner perspective they see it as no impedance to access. The main drawbacks, it does not have our safety improvements and does not meet our policies. What we are recommending, again, here's our matrix. We're not going to go through that, but we are going to recommend moving forward with alternative A uh, because it does provide the safety benefits and that has the uh, two-way mall entrance and exit at Shirley Avenue and the three-quarter access at the other mall entrance place. It meets our design policies and we say that it provides reasonable access to properties. Uh, we do not recommend moving forward with alternatives B and C for what, what you see here. This is the toughest part, Carolyn Avenue. This has actually uh, plagued 41st Street and the interchange probably since it was built. And if you remember, um, Carolyn Avenue was there long before the interstate was there. So they, yeah, they were there first and then the interstate came along and it's been difficult to solve uh, the problems at Carolyn Avenue. This is the no-build condition, um, what's there now as well. This area is where we have all kinds of crashes. When we've met with the business owners, they have specifically said, is there any way we can eliminate or get rid of these crashes because they see so many um, ambulances and fire trucks come to crashes in this area. So they have begged us, we have to do something here to uh, eliminate or reduce the crashes right in this area. Okay, if we do nothing, if we leave it the way it is, uh, we don't improve the safety, especially here, uh, we don't improve the pedestrian facilities, and we don't move Carolyn Avenue away from, for, from the ramp. Uh, that is just too close. Uh, there's just no way, uh, no two ways around it, and it's in the right turn lane for I-29 northbound. We developed six alternatives for Carolyn Avenue, so bear with me, we'll go through these very quickly. Uh, the first one is just a right in, right out on Carolyn Avenue. The raised median would prohibit left, uh, left out movements. Um, in this case, uh, we would not have any property acquisitions. Uh, we really wouldn't impact to a great extent uh, business access along Carolyn Avenue. So this was well supported by the Carolyn Avenue business owners. However, uh, it does not move the uh, Carolyn Avenue intersection out of the ramp turn lane, and it also does not meet the spacing requirements uh, from an interstate ramp to any kind of a driveway or city street. So let's go on to alternative two. 
In this case, we slid Carolyn Avenue over just to get it a little bit further away from I-29, but we still couldn't get it far enough, uh, in this case, to get it out of that right turn lane. Um, so this is pretty much like alternative one. Uh, there, you can still get access to all of these businesses from Carolyn Avenue and 41st Street. Again, the business owners liked it. Uh, in this case, we would have to buy out this Red Rock Inn. So a business acquisition. And again, the, uh, the intersection still stays in the right turn lane for the, for the ramp. Uh, alternative three, we took a different type of look at it. What happens if we can only go right on uh, 41st Street to Carolyn Avenue? Just trying to creatively come up with ways to solve the problems here. And in this case, you couldn't come back and enter 41st Street. We'd, we'd block it off and make a cul-de-sac, so you'd have to actually turn back around. Uh, it does at least maintain access to 41st Street, from 41st Street to Carolyn Avenue. You can make this movement. Uh, so therefore, we did get good support from the business owners, at least some support uh, for this alternative. Uh, however, in this case, it would require buying out the Pizza Hut delivery service. And um, we'd also have to close off this access here just because of grade differences. And again, the intersection stays in the turn lane for the ramp. So that basically is a fatal flaw uh, for the, inter for the uh, alternative. I will say that in previous studies, we did not anticipate the need for this right turn lane. As we went back and re-looked at this very carefully with year 2045 traffic volumes, we did determine that yes, this right turn lane is absolutely necessary to make this whole interchange to make 41st Street function properly. Now let's go to a couple of more drastic alternatives which uh, are cul-de-sacs. This would actually um, cut off access from Carolyn Avenue to 41st Street with a cul-de-sac. So you could not get between 41st Street and Carolyn Avenue. One thing I want to point out is when we met with the um, hotel owners along here, some of them told us that they specifically tell their patrons to get to 41st Street from 38th Street and then Shirley Avenue. They really discourage their patrons from using uh, the Carolyn Avenue 41st Street intersection because it is so dangerous. In this case, if we do close this off, all of the people that would use Carolyn Avenue have to come around here uh, to a very much improved intersection and then come up to 38th Street, and we'd have to put a signal here to make that work. Our main benefits here, it does meet our spacing requirements, no doubt about that. Uh, dramatically improves safety uh, because you're eliminating that very uh, unsafe connection between 41st Street and Carolyn Avenue. It does require the uh, Pizza Hut acquisition. And there is a possibility that people that want to um, get to Carolyn Avenue may actually cut through uh, the driveway access to um, the Kings Mart and the frying pan, actually come through their uh, parking lots to get to Carolyn Avenue. The idea is that if the, if the improvements are made here and here, that's a much better way for people uh, to get over to Carolyn Avenue, and that's the route that they will choose rather than going through businesses. Uh, because we're cutting off access between Carolyn Avenue and 41st Street, we have had limited support from businesses, although, like I said, the hotels, some of them recognize that, okay, something has to change. Um, let's look at Alternative 5. This is the same as Alternative 4, except the cul-de-sac is now shifted and we, we flip it over to the uh, east side of Carolyn Avenue. Virtually, you know, everything else is the same. It gives us our spacing requirements to the interstate ramp. It improves the safety. In this case, we would have to purchase the Red Rock Inn uh, Hotel. Again, we potentially would have cut through traffic uh, through the frying pan and the Kings Mart. And again, because we've cut off access uh, to Carolyn Avenue from 41st Street, we've had limited support from the Carolyn Avenue businesses. Because of that feedback uh, from property owners, we developed this alternative, the final one that we'll look at tonight, I promise you. This is what we called Alternative 6, Realign Carolyn Avenue. We basically take it over to the mall entrance, and you can see what that does. Uh, it forces us to buy out uh, three properties. 
And like I said, because we met with landowners, they suggested that we try something else. Uh, and this was one of the things that was suggested, just to see what would happen to maintain that Carolyn, Carolyn Avenue access to 41st Street and meet all of the other criteria. This is what you would have to do. Our benefits here, it does meet our spacing requirements. It does you know, have minor impacts to Carolyn Avenue business access. However, uh, acquiring these three properties is costly, and we certainly don't want to buy out businesses if we don't have to. Where that shows up is in our comparison matrix. Uh, difficult to see here, but um, in our property impacts and in, in, in our costs. Uh, we are taking roughly 150,000 square feet of commercial property uh, in comparison, you know, maybe 50%, 40% less uh, for the other alternatives. And our cost is more than doubled what all of the alter other alternatives are. We're talking probably over a five and a half million dollar cost just to do this Carolyn Avenue uh, realignment. So that's a big factor in our decision and in our recommendation. What we are recommending tonight is that we move forward with the cul-de-sac alternatives. And based on feedback that we get from you, we'll make a decision on which one of these uh, we should move forward with. Uh, the cul-de-sac alternatives, they meet the traffic, safety, and design criteria. Here's a little extra. Um, we are saying that they provide reasonable access to businesses because uh, we're showing that three-quarter uh, configuration, access configuration at the Empire Mall entrance for 41st Street. We would put a signal at 38th and Shirley, and we would dramatically improve the intersection at 41st and Shirley Avenue to give people an alternate route, a better route, to get to the businesses along Carolyn Avenue than trying to use the 41st Street, Carolyn Avenue intersection. We are not recommending moving forward with any of the other alternatives. Uh, the ones that keep Carolyn Avenue in the right turn lane uh, are really not allowed. And we are saying that this acquisition of three properties and the additional costs is the reason that we would not recommend moving forward with alternative six realigning Carolyn Avenue. Thank you for being patient. Uh, the next steps here, we would ask if any of you want to make any comments that would become part of the written record and we do look at those, well, <laughs> we compile them, we review them and we are required to address those comments. Um, we'd ask that you fill out your comment cards and get us back, get them back to us by May 24th. And then finally, uh, the study advisory team will finalize our environmental study with a selected alternative. What happens after that? Uh, probably starting in 2018, we would begin the next phase of the project, which would be more detailed design. We call it preliminary design. Uh, we'd probably start with property acquisitions and the various permitting processes that go with a project like this. Then in year 2023 is our anticipated time frame for beginning construction. Those are our next steps. Uh, our website, everything that you see tonight, all of the documents that we've produced are on our website. Hopefully uh, you'll take some time to look at that and verify maybe what we've said tonight. Our contact people for the, uh, for the project are Steve Graham from the Department of Transportation, uh, Shannon Austin from the City of Sioux Falls, and uh, myself from HDR Engineering. 